All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's Grand Rounds with Dr. Preminger. If anyone has any questions at all throughout the talk, please just write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens and then we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Now I'd just like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Biaviva Preminger is a board certified plastic surgeon on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, specializing in aesthetic and reconstructive surgery of both the face and body. She holds a BA with honors from Harvard University, an MD from Cornell University Medical College, and an MPH from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. She completed her postgraduate surgical training at Cornell and Columbia and did a research fellowship in breast reconstruction at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She holds faculty teaching appointments in surgery at Columbia University and in ethics at Cornell University. She is president of the New York State Society of Plastic Surgeons and is active in the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. She has been featured in the New York Times and New York Magazine's Top Doctors, as well as People Magazine, New Beauty, New York Lifestyles, Bella Magazine, and Essence Magazine. Dr. Preminger is a key opinion leader for some of the leading plastic surgery technology companies and helps to oversee ethical practices for the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. She lives in New York City and has three children who attend Ramaz and Park East Day School. She is an active member of Kehillat Yishrin Synagogue. And without further ado, take it away, Dr. Preminger. All right. So uh, without, without any further ado, I'm gonna talk tonight about aesthetic plastic surgery, some of the origins, indications, and the minimally invasive and invasive treatment options that are available today. So um, here's a little bit of an outline of the talk. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history of plastic surgery and some of its uniquely Jewish origins. And then we're gonna get uh, right into all the indications and the techniques. The word plastic surgery, like where did it come from, actually originated from the Greek uh, plastikos, which means to shape or to mold. And plastic surgery principles actually allow the plastic surgeon to solve unusual and complex problems. And plastic surgeons are basically considered uh, problem solvers. It's one of the reasons why I like what I do. So this is a quote from Gaspari Tagliacozzi, one of the fathers or widely considered the father of plastic surgery. We restore, repair, and make whole those parts which nature has given, but fortune has taken away. Not so much that they may delight the eye, but that may buoy up the spirit and help the mind of the afflicted. So that's what we as plastic surgeons do. This is a little bit about the training that we get as plastic surgeons. Some of it's in uh, reconstructive surgery, and then some of it is cosmetic and we do microsurgery, burns, hand surgery, craniofacial surgery. There's a lot of variety and some plastic surgeons specialize in only one or the other. Why did I become a plastic surgeon? Because I like treating patients from head to toe. I like treating patients of all ages. I like doing a mix of cosmetic and reconstructive surgery. And I like being what's called the surgeon surgeon gets back to kind of problem solving. Other surgeons call us uh, often when they, when they run into, when they run into trouble. And it's a fun role to be in. And I love the artistic element of it, which obviously is pretty subjective. This is, these are some, some photos from an episode of the Twilight Zone called Eye of the Beholder, um, in which this patient undergoes plastic surgery to correct her disfigurement. And it actually turns out when everybody turns around that she's beautiful and everybody else um, is, is disfigured and, and looks, like a, looks like a pig. So some of this is obviously very, uh, very subjective. Uh, I like the collaboration that goes on within plastic surgery. This is the ways in which um, we can actually offer uh, help to a lot of different, a lot of different specialties, including pediatrics, internal medicine, general surgeons, OBGYNs, dermatologists, or orthopedists. This is a little bit. I'm I'm going to focus mostly on cosmetic stuff tonight, but here's a little a, a little bit of a view on some of the. Um, some of the reconstructive stuff that we do. This is a patient with a congenital breast deformity that I, this is a patient of mine that I reconstructed. Um, this is a, this is a bad third degree burn that got grafted. This is sort of typical bread and butter stuff. I often get called about lacerations, pediatricians calling me saying, does this need a suture? Does it not need a suture? Um, and then this is a breast reconstruction case, but it's actually a uh, a uh, complicated case of a patient who had breast implants that were removed and then she uh, she was reconstructed. This is a patient of mine. So obviously there's a lot of variety. We do face and body, all sorts of ages. Um, and this is, uh, this is a skin lesion that was malignant and had to be removed. And um, it obviously created a, a big defect that couldn't just simply be closed. And so these are yin yang flaps that are used to close the defect. And by the time this is closed, you can't even tell that, that anything happened here. Um, 
this is a Venn diagram. Uh, plastic surgeons have a lot of overlap with a lot of other specialties, including derm, uh, ENT, and ophthalmology. Um, and we often get to collaborate together, which is really nice. Uh, but plastic surgery has changed a lot over the years. <laughs> On the left is an image of what it used to be like, and this is an image of now. Um, and social media has really changed the landscape in plastic surgery in terms of um, the exposure plastic surgeons get, in terms of um, uh, the general day-to-day -day exposure patients get. And you know, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, the pros are that we get to do a lot of outreach. Um, we get to maybe access patients that we didn't get, that we couldn't access before, and patients have access to information that they might not have had access to previously. There's a lot more transparency. But I think that you know the con is that you can't really decipher professional competence. Uh, there are questions of confidentiality, quality of care, conflicts of interest, and just plain old taste. So as far as the evolution of plastic surgery is concerned, so much has changed over the years. You know, in 1923, Fanny Bryce, who was Jewish, underwent a rhinoplasty, and Americans wanted to know why she had done something like that. But by the 1960s, Barbara Streisand didn't have her nose done, and everybody wanted to know why she didn't do it. And then you get to 2021 and Sarah Jessica Parker just can't win. Uh, whether she ages naturally um, or, or does too much, she's been criticized on both ends of it. So it, it's definitely com complicated and a lot has changed over the years. Well, plastic surgery has always been a product of its time. And this is some of the early, early origins of plastic surgery. Um, in ancient Egypt, plastic surgery was actually often used to glorify the dead. Um, in ancient India, they, um, they used plastic surgery to repair noses and ears that were lost either as punishment for crimes, they would cut their noses off um, or in battle. And But in the Middle Ages, plastic surgery um, came up against uh, a lot of trouble because it was considered to be pagan and sinful. Plastic surgeons were often considered to just be like quacks and barber surgeons. But by the Renaissance, there was actually a rise in plastic surgery. And Taglia Cosi, who I mentioned previously, who's widely considered the father of plastic surgery, wrote the first plastic surgery textbook. But again, plastic surgeons ran into, early plastic surgeons ran into a lot of trouble with religious authority and Taglia Cosi actually was excommunicated and his corpse was ultimately exhumed from its grave um, uh, as punishment. So plastic surgery is Jewish origins. Adam Sandler, as we, as we all know, there's a holiday of Hanukkah just actually wrapped up. And as Adam Sandler puts it, everything has its own Jewish origin. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the Jewish origins of plastic surgery. So, I mean, the first one is kind of a joke, but you know, Hashem made a woman from the rib he had taken out of a man, which theoretically was the first graft that, that, uh, that actually happened. But um, in all seriousness, Jacques Joseph was the father of modern rhinoplasty. Um, and he actually was Jewish and, and he, he was basically treating Jewish patients who wanted to look less Jewish uh, because they were encountering anti-Semitism. And then Freud actually introduced the concept that plastic surgery offered a cure for unhappiness. And so this was a way to actually say that plastic surgeons were no longer quacks, but they were actually treating things that patients were suffering from. <laughs> and then in 1930, <coughs> excuse me, in 1931, Jewish refugees were the ones who founded what is now known as the American Society of Plastic Surgeons um, because they were excluded from what at the time was predominantly the, the big plastic surgery society that now is actually a much smaller and less commonly well-known one. So just a few interesting facts. But ultimately it was wartime that led plastic surgery to take off, particularly due to trench warfare because um, there were a lot of facial injuries and burns because everybody was kind of hiding out in trenches and then they would pick their heads up to shoot and they would often get their faces blown apart. So uh, where are we today in plastic surgery? I'm gonna focus on cosmetic surgery now. I'm gonna talk about face and body surgery and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the minimally invasive um, and, the, uh, and the invasive options in both. So let's start with face. So what happens as we age? Uh, basically there's increased skin laxity, the skin thins, the lips, thin, you get smoker's lines, you lose facial fat, and then there are all sorts of lines that start to form. Um, you can see it in, in, uh, in the picture up top where you get these, these transverse forehead lines, glabellar lines are those 11 lines that make you look angry, bunny lines by, by your nose. Um, you can also get crow's feet, those are by the side of the eyes, deep nasal labial folds, marionette lines that look like puppet lines. Uh, brow descent, uh, and then malar descent, which is basically the cheeks, 
start to fall and you end up with, uh, with jowl formation. And then the other thing that happens, you get neck laxity and platysmal bands as the muscle starts to loosen. So what are some of the minimally invasive options for the face? Uh, we have neurotoxin, filler, skin resurfacing, and then general neck and face rejuvenation, so mental fat reduction. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these and what the options are. People are often very confused, like where do we use Botox? Where do we use filler? What's the difference? So um, Botox is a neurotoxin and it's basically used to stop movement in areas whereas filler actually is, is uh, restoring volume that's lost. So this, let's go through some of the different options. How does a neurotoxin work? Basically, Botox inhibits acetylcholine release and, and basically stops the muscle from, from being allowed to, to stimulate. Um, so these are the neurotoxins that are available, Botox, Dysport, Xeom, and Juveau. Um, you know, what are really, what are really the differences? I, I'll be honest, I don't, I, you know, I have no disclosures with any of this. I don't like Juveau. I don't think it works very well. Xeom and last the least long. My two favorites are, are Dysport and Botox. Um, what are the real differences? Um, diffusion, uh, Dysport tends to diffuse a little bit more than Botox does. And as far as longevity is concerned, I would say that Dysport probably has the longest lo longevity um, and they get diluted differently when you're going to inject them. Uh, people often ask me, women in particular, um, religious women in particular, whether they can use Botox while they're pregnant or breastfeeding. And what I usually say is there's really just not sufficient data because there've been no studies done, but um, this stuff really isn't absorbed systemically. So some people choose to take that risk, others don't. What are fillers? So fillers, there are different types of fillers. So there are hyaluronic acid-based fillers, calcium hydroxyapatate base fillers, and what's called poly-L lactic acid fillers. The hyaluronic acid-based ones are the ones that you usually hear about. Juvederm Voluma, Restylane, there are newer ones called Versa and the RHA, RHA line. Calcium hydroxyapatite is Radiesse. There's only one product out there like that. And then poly-L lactic acid is Sculptra, um, which really never goes away and builds your own collagen. So here are all the different applications of filler. Basically, you can use it to fill any hollows, uh, tear troughs. Um, I don't actually like to use it in the creases between the brows because there have been reports of blindness from that, but this is what's used as a liquid rhinoplasty. You can use it in your nasolabial folds, the marionette lines, gives back volume in the cheek and give a a little bit of a lift to prevent that jowl, the hollow temples that start to develop with age, we can fill those. And I've even used them in earlobes as they start to thin um, for extra support, particularly for people who have recurrent earlobe tears because the earlobes are so thin. What are all the differences between all of these fillers? Um, some are more cross-linked and thicker than, the, uh, than others, but my preference generally is to try to stick to the hyaluronic acid fillers because if you run into any trouble or a patient doesn't like it, they're pretty easily dissolved with hyaluronidase. Um, most of them last somewhere between six to 12 months on average. I would say about a year on average. So, but what's the most natural and long lasting filler? It's actually fat, um, you know, but you can run into other trouble with fat in areas that are particularly thin like the lower eyelids. So you do, have to uh, exercise caution with fat, but it's definitely a great filler for the cheeks, for the nasal labial folds. I love to use it in conjunction with my facelifts. So let's talk a little bit about skin resurfacing here. My, my favorite lasers um, are fractionated C, a basic fractionated CO2 for fine lines and an IPL for brown spots. Peels are also, um, peels are also fantastic. Um, everybody always thinks about that Sex in the City episode um, where Samantha had her whole face burned off. Actually, that's a pretty aggressive peel. So your other option, instead of doing one aggressive peel, actually, is that you can do a series of, um, of much less strong peels and do like four of them and stage them like two weeks apart. And that's often just as effective with less downtime. Uh, submental fat reduction options. So uh, there are two great, really non-invasive options. One of them is cool sculpting, which is completely non-invasive, doesn't involve any injections at all. And the other one is Kybellar deoxycholic acid, um, which dissolves fat. Um, they're both pretty effective. In order to use cool sculpting, you need to have a handpiece that fits correctly. They make this cool mini handpiece, but it's not, it's not contoured for everybody's uh, submental fat. And then the, the upside with Kybella is that you can really use it on anyone 
the only downside of it is that at the beginning, it does tend to cause more swelling than cool sculpting does. Um, but they're both they're both actually uh, they're both actually pretty effective in general. Uh, but neither of these actually um, confers any kind of skin tightening. So this is really just for fat. As far as neck tightening is concerned, that's uh, a little less invasive. I think your best options are radio frequency based devices. Um, I did used to have Ulthera, which is an ultrasound based device. It was very painful and didn't work very well. It became a doorstop in my office, and so. I've really transitioned to using radio frequency based um, devices like FaceTight, Fractura, Morpheus. Fractura and Morpheus are microneedling devices. Um, and FaceTight is a minimally invasive device that often gets combined with liposuction. So it's internal heating and it can actually be done completely under local anesthesia. I did it this afternoon um, and there's very minimal downtime. So now let's talk about some invasive options for the face. Um, brow lift, blepharoplasty, rhinoplasty, facelift, neck lift, earlobe repair. We're gonna cover all of those um, relatively quickly here. And, and I'll talk to you about the indications for all, all of them. So the female brow should actually lay about half a centimeter to a centimeter above the supraorbital ridge. And the male brow should actually be lo located at the level of the supraorbital bridge. But what starts to happen as we age is that that brow starts to descend. Uh, there are a lot of different brow lift options, which usually means that none of them works perfectly for anyone. Um, and there are upsides and downsides to them all. There's a coronal brow lift, which basically is the most effective, but is a pretty bloody operation um, that can involve hair loss. And you know, we used to do it when I was a resident. I think it's rare that anybody does it now. I think these days, most people strict, stick to um, a brow pexy through an or eyelid blepharoplasty incision or an anterior hairline incision here to give you some lateral brow lifting, which is a, which is a direct excision. There are also endoscopic brow lifts. Um, I think people have gotten away from those a little bit more. So they, they used to have these like carpet tacks that you put in internally to kind of lift things, but they, they didn't stay very well long-term. Uh, blepharoplasty is upper and lower eyelid surgery. So uh, basically the, in, the indications are, are extra skin in the upper and lower eyelids and what we call fat pseudo herniation. And what starts to happen as we age is that the muscle actually thins and the fat starts to protrude. We do, you do need to rule out any true upper eyelid ptosis and that's not something that uh, most plastic surgeons manage. If that exists, usually I'll send someone to see a, an actual um, ophthalmologist. You wanna make sure the patient, patient doesn't have a history of dry eyes and always check lower lid integrity to avoid any kind of atropion. So for techniques, the upper blepharoplasty incision, as you can see on the, on the upper right, is a pretty straightforward um, upper eyelid uh, excision, but the, the lower eyelid, there are different options for. So there are transconjunctival approaches versus subciliary approaches. Um, one is just um, an internal incision in the conjunctiva, and then the other one is actually an external incision. Um, it sort of depends on whether somebody has any any extra um, any extra skin laxity, which can also be addressed by uh, by adding a laser to the procedure. And the upper bluff can be done under straight local anesthesia. I do it all the time. Sutures stay in for five to seven days. The recovery from eyelid surgery is uh, is really quick. And the nice thing about it is, in most cases, people don't even know you've had anything done after after a week, and they just think you've had some good rest. And here's an example of a before and after of my patient on whom I did upper and lower eyelid surgery. Um, and, uh, and as you can imagine, she was pretty pleased with this. So rhinoplasty, um, indications. Uh, there are cosmetic concerns of wide nasal bones. We usually talk about the, the nose in thirds, so upper, middle, and lower thirds. So usually the upper third concern is wide nasal bones or a dorsal hump. And then as we start to get towards the tip, you run into things like people complaining the tip is too full or bulbous. Um, you can get an over or under rotated tip. Um, classically in the Jewish patient, it's more of an over rotated tip. Um, sorry, more of an under rotated tip, which, which actually droops when the patient smiles. Um, the other thing people run into is wide nasal ala. Uh, you always want to check if the patient's had any history of trauma or breathing difficulties. Uh, to make sure that we're not making any of that worse when doing their rhinoplasty. And sometimes there are actually functional indications as well, such as a deviated septum or enlarged turbinates. So rhinoplasty, there are open versus closed approaches. Honestly, um, 
I don't, most people are comfortable with one or the other technique and it just has to do with how they, how they trained. I think traditionally um, they used to teach more of a closed approach. And now I think they're just much, there's much more flexibility with an open approach. So I think these days, most people tend to do more of an open approach. Um, it, it's not a particularly painful procedure, believe it or not, a splint stays in place for five to seven days. And sometimes people have, you know, packing in their nose for a day or two. And this is one of my patients before and after. Um, and you can tell it made a, she's a pretty girl, but she looks even prettier now that we fixed her nose. So uh, facelift, neck lift, next. Um, what are the indications? So a lot of the stuff that we talked about with facial skin laxity, jowl formation, submental fat, and platysmal banding. There are various approaches. The incision is really the same usually, or some amount of the incision on the right, but, um, there used to be subcutaneous approaches. Now the approaches tend to be what's called a SMAS approach, which is the continuation of the platysma in the face so that you can actually give muscle support. Um, and then there are subperiosteal approaches. To be honest with you, the, um, the subperiosteal approaches haven't really been shown to afford any, um, any increased rejuvenation, but there's a significantly increased risk of, uh, of nerve damage actually with that procedure. So I usually do a SMAS approach. Um, a mini facelift can actually just be done under straight local anesthesia. I did a facelift this morning. It was a full facelift and I actually just did it with an anesthesiologist and some sedation, uh, just some deep sedation. Uh, Post-operatively, the patient stays with a nurse overnight. She has drains overnight and, and, and a, one of those traditional head wraps that you see. Um, and then recovery is usually pretty quick and uh, facelift is usually not that painful. So here are examples of some of my patients. This is a pretty prominent jowl she had before on the left and you can see on the right that that's resolved. Um, here's another one of my patients. You can see that, that turkey neck that she has on the left and she was very pleased because on the, on the right it's gone. And you can see you really can't see any kind of a, any kind of a scar. Uh, again, another turkey neck there and um, on the left, that's the before and on the right, that's her after. And again, uh, you know, you're looking right at where the scar was and it's pretty hard to see it usually falls within the creases. Another thing I like to talk about that I do a lot of are earlobe repairs. Uh, they're partial versus complete tears. These are pretty common. They can be fixed under local anesthesia. The sutures usually stay in only for a week um, and, um, and uh, the patient gets re-pierced at, um, at six weeks, usually in a slightly different uh, location. The difference between a partial versus a complete tear, you can see it here. The left side is a partial tear, the right side is a complete tear, um, and both of them were, uh, were pretty easily fixed. I think it's important for people to know the timeline that it takes six weeks to be able to re-pierce because I always get people coming in and saying, oh, I have my sister's wedding or whatever it is and I need to wear earrings and they need to actually leave themselves enough time for the repair to heal before we can re-pierce them. So you're looking at um, six weeks to re-pierce and then another six weeks with the newly pierced, those, those special little studs in. So you gotta give yourself at least 12 weeks to be able to wear the earrings that you're really dying to wear at that wedding. Uh, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, about body procedures and uh, we'll start with the minimally invasive options. There are a lot of options out there. I'll talk about the ones that I think that are effective. Um, cool sculpting has gotten a lot of bad press lately with Linda Evangelista. I don't, I don't think that, there, that there's really any, um, any substance to any of her complaints. I think, I think that whole story is a little complicated. Um, cool sculpting is, is cryotherapy basically. Um, it's fat freezing. What it does is it sucks the fat in. It's completely non-invasive. You can be in the gym the next day and then the fat cells die and you, you pee them out. Um, the fat cells take 30 to 60 days to die. Um, you can actually just do one round of treatments per area, depending on how the handpiece fits. Uh, or I often recommend that patients just do a repeat at 30 days to get the best results. Um, this is body type, which is a little more invasive than cool sculpting. Um, it's what I would call minimally invasive. It's liposuction um, with bipolar radio frequency, and that's the body type device that you're looking at up top. It's basically the body handpiece of the face type handpiece that we were talking about before. It's a slightly larger handpiece um, that uh, that causes uh, a little more energy to be to to be conferred to the uh, to the area but it's usually performed under, uh, under local anesthesia. There's very little downtime to it. And all liposuction, just so you understand, actually has 
the same two steps and anything, whether it's laser liposuction or radiofrequency based body liposuction, just really um, includes an extra step. So the first step is what we call tumescence, which is injection with a fluid that um, has epinephrine and lidocaine in it for hemostasis and for pain control. And then there's the liposuction step, which is the suctioning. Any of these other modalities that introduce energy, introduce them for the purpose of skin tightening, uh, decreasing bruising, allowing for easier removal of fat, and all of those, whether you're talking about vasor liposuction, smart lipo, or radiofrequency-based liposuction, all just introduce a step in the middle. I've used all of them. I think that, um, I think that body tight or radiofrequency based liposuction has basically replaced smart lipo because it just works better. I do think there are other indications for ultrasound based liposuction, for example, in gynecomastia, men's chests that can often be very fibrous or areas that are very substantially scarred from previous liposuction. So here's an example of a patient of mine who underwent liposuction of her inner and outer thighs. And you know, liposuction really works amazingly well as a treatment for you know, a patient who's otherwise in really good shape and has a specific problem area, like on this patient who's pretty thin um, and really was complaining about her outer thighs. So as far as uh, larger areas, liposuction also works really well in these areas. Um, this is also a patient of mine. These are her flanks. And you can see she was obviously very happy um, with the amount of fat reduction she got from, from this liposuction. So invasive options. Uh, let's talk about breast and, and body, um, especially we, we have a lot of a lot of women um, that I'm speaking to tonight who've had kids. And I think that that uh, causes a lot of changes um, in all of our bodies. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about breast augmentation, breast reduction, abdominoplasty, arm lift, thigh plasty, and labiaplasty. So a lot to cover. Uh, this slide always makes me laugh. Um, I, I, this, is, this is what happens with years to women's breasts. Um, it's sort of the reverse of what we do measuring our children against a wall and marking, and marking the years as they grow up, um, the breasts tend to fall down. Um, so what can be done to correct this? So a breast lift is otherwise known as a mastopexy. A breast lift with augmentation is what we call a mastopexy augmentation. There's also a breast reduction, which is a decreased breast size. And what procedure we do actually depends on the amount of breast tissue the patient has, how much breast tissue they're trying to actually achieve, and the degree of ptosis or sagging that the patient uh, has. So here are just some general considerations when we consider doing any surgery on the breast. Um, breastfeeding, nipple sensation, um, which can be lost. Often patients will also get increased sensation after surgery, believe it or not, uh, what the patient's side goals are and how much scarring they're willing to tolerate. So for example, from a lift, there are various techniques. Um, the more scarring, the more of a lift you can actually achieve. And often it's a trade-off between scarring and the shape that you can, that you can get. So um, as far as... Um, the, uh, the indications for a breast reduction or lift. Um, usually insurance will only cover if we're removing more than 500 grams per side. Um, today I heard about an insurance company that said 750 grams had to be removed for coverage. So they're always, they're always moving the goalposts, so to speak. Um, but you wanna have documented back pain, neck pain, a documented having gone to physical therapy is really helpful. Um, intertrigenous irritation is a big one and shoulder grooving that's visible on preoperative photos. So um, we wanna make sure that um, patients over 35 have a mammogram. There's actually no absolute standard for this. Um, this is kind of something that I've come up with on my own that I require for patients um, that we get a baseline if they're over 35 and they haven't, um, they haven't had any mam mammogram before. Um, and this is, you know, this this is their first surgery, so we know kind of where they're starting. The procedure is usually done under general anesthesia, um, unless it's really just like a periareal or mastopexy, which we could do under local. Any tissue that's removed from the breast always goes to pathology, um, not for breast augmentation, but for breast reduction. Um, I do usually put trains in if it's a larger reduction, they'll stay in for about five to seven days. Patient wears a post-operative bra for six weeks and no underwire for three months. So this, um, a breast reduction operation is actually a little bit complicated because it's all based on the blood supply to the nipple and the surgeon determines whether that's based superiorly, inferiorly, medially, super immediately, laterally. These are all options um, that allow um, kind of creativity in shaping the breast 
um, allowing for for kind of volume where you want it and moving it from where you don't want it. It's usually sitting in the lower pole of the breast and we usually want to move it, uh, move it back up. So here's an example of a patient of mine's breast reduction markings. And here's her before and, uh, and here's her after. And she was, she was pretty pleased with her results. This is actually a young patient. This is, a, this is a teenager. And this is actually what she looked like before. And you can imagine she was pretty thrilled with the way she looked like after. Um, this, is a, this is an older woman who came in for a breast reduction. She had a pretty substantial asymmetry. Uh, which is common. I usually tell patients their sister's not twins. Um, and I was able to correct a lot of that with her reduction. And she actually has full what we call anchor or wise pattern scars, but you can see how you can see how faint they become at over a year. Um, this patient here before her scars are her scars are less mature. This is a mastopexy or a lift with tissue rearrangement. This patient didn't have any implants. I actually just used her own tissue to try to give her back more volume and she was pretty happy. So let's also talk about breast augmentation, which is kind of the opposite of a reduction. These patients don't have enough volume. They've either never had enough volume or they've lost volume with breastfeeding and pregnancy, et cetera. Um, and then some patients also just come in with sagging and a breast implant gives more volume and it can actually afford a lift in that way. Um, considerations with any kind of breast augmentation. I usually talk about the four S's with my patient and, and with my patients and they have to do with um, where a scar is placed, um, whether we're using um, silicone or saline implants, um, the size that we're choosing and whether we're going subpectoral or sub, in other words, under the pec muscle or putting the, the implant directly under the breast. As far as incisions, you can actually place the incisions under the breast fold by the areola and the underarm or actually by the umbilicus if it's a saline implant. I, uh, I don't do trans umbilical operations. I don't think they give you particularly good access. I tend to think that axillary incisions are more visible than the other two. I tend to stick with either inframammary or periareolar scars. I think in the long-term inframammary scars, um, just give you the best access, especially these aren't permanent devices. Eventually they need to be changed out. I do a lot of revision breast augmentation. When I have to come back to do a revision, um, I always, I almost always have to use one of those inframammary scars anyway. So I usually recommend it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the controversy with breast implants. In 1992, the FDA actually placed silicone gel breast implants in a moratorium. Um, but then they found that um, uh, even, it, even though this wasn't actually based on, on data, they said that there wasn't enough information to demonstrate that they were effective. And so in 1995, the Dow Corning Corporation actually went bankrupt because they were the ones uh, manufacturing these implants and they had to deal with so many lawsuits. But in 2006, the FDA actually lifted its restrictions against silicone gel implants for breast reconstruction and also for augmentation mammoplasty. But the approval was conditioned upon FDA monitoring, completion of these 10 in your mark studies, to be honest, they used to require um, or recommend mammograms every three years. Now, based upon the data that they've seen, they've actually extended that out to you don't need it until five years, uh, an MRI until five years uh, for any kind of screening. But there's been a lot of hype and a lot, a lot in the news about um, something called ALCL, which is a breast implant associated lymphoma that's basically, for the most part, associated with textured implants that aren't so widely used in the United States but uh, are pretty widely used in South America or were. Um, and so between that and something called BII, which is breast implant illness that nobody knows if it's a real entity or not. Um, there was li literally as recently as less than a month ago, a black box warning placed on at the actual implant box for patients and a checklist that we have to go over with our patients before we place, place implants. Um, they, uh, they basically let patients know that these aren't considered lifetime devices and they have been associated, the textured implants have been associated with ALCL and that there are these breast implant illness discussions out there. Um, and it, they're, they're, they're kind of uh, very nonspecific and we don't really know if they're actually attributable to the breast implants. But, you know, I stopped using textured implants at all probably over five years ago go now. Um, and I put silicone smooth implants in all the time. I tell patients that the real difference between silicone and saline implants are that when they rupture, and eventually they will rupture because they're man-made devices, 
um, the saline implants kind of just deflate and go fat, flat because the saline is absorbed. Um, but um, the silicone implants, the silicone is very cohesive. It sticks together. I just go in, I take the implant out. The silicone kind of all comes out sticky together. I wash everything out. I put in a new silicone implant. But I tell people that they have to be able to sleep at night. There's no question that the silicone implants feel more natural than the saline implants. Um, but I give patients the options to choose whatever they're more comfortable with. I like to use 3D imaging and also a sizing bra with pockets for patients to try on different uh, implant sizes. And this is great. The 3D imaging really allows them to, um, to envision what they might look like with implants. And it creates a common, um, kind of a common discourse. So I really know what they want because a B isn't a B to everybody and a C means different things to, to people. And I, you know, I think most of us who've gone bra shopping know that like a 32C is the same as a 34B. So, you know, what I really want to know is what do you want to look like? And this is, I think this is really helpful having this technology in my office. Here are just some examples of my breast augmentation patients. Um, and you can and really see how much loss of volume can be corrected and get some lifting as well. This is a mastopexy augmentation. This is a revision. She actually had implants in before. You can see how sagging everything was before and you can see how much of a lift she got and how much more upper pole fullness she got. And I did a periareolar lift on her so you can see those scars as well, which haven't fully faded yet. So let's talk about abdominoplasties, tummy tucks. Um, they remove excess skin and fat and they also include tightening of the abdominal muscles. Uh, or the rectus muscles. And we can also use liposuction as an adjunct to help contour. So here are the indications. You know, with pregnancy, the rectus muscles separate. They never fully come back together again in most women, um, depending on how active you are before. Uh, I tell patients you want to really try to exercise as much as you can and through your pregnancy, because the more you can kind of work out those muscles, the better of a chance you have of of, that, uh, of those muscles coming back together after the pregnancy and maintaining some kind of abdominal wall integrity. Um, and then the abdominoplasty actually will address the extra skin and extra abdominal fat. Um, you can also address an umbilical or a ventral hernia at the same time, revise a fan and still scar uh, from a C-section. A lot of patient people have that like kind of hanging over um, pouch that really bothers them or that shelf. Um, but you really, I want to make sure that these patients are done having children, not because it's dangerous, but because it's just kind of a waste of money if you stretch everything out again. So here are the techniques. There are actually different types of abdominoplasties. There's the traditional full abdominoplasty, which leaves you with a lower abdominal and periumbilical scar. There's a modified abdominoplasty, at least that's what I call it, where I actually, uh, you don't get any periumbilical scar, you just get a lower abdominal scar and we lower the belly button down from the inside a little bit, um, or float it is what it's called. There's also a mini abdominoplasty, which I'll often use just to correct that little shelf from a C-section. Uh, the full and the modified abdominoplasties are always performed under general anesthesia, but a mini abdominoplasty um, is sometimes uh, performed actually under straight local anesthesia. I can do it in my office. Um, the more tissue you remove, the more likely I am to kind of place drains. Um, or though there are things called progressive tension sutures that allow us to avoid tra uh, drains if we can. And then people are in a post-op garment. I usually like to keep them in a garment for at least two weeks, um, ideally six weeks if they can tolerate it. A lot of them start to like the compression garment and it's like a girdle and they wear it all the time anyway. Um, considerations in which technique to choose are how much extra tissue does the patient have? Um, do they have a diastasis that needs to be uh, sewn back together or plicated? Um, and, and what are we doing with the belly button? Do they want to scar around it? Do they not want to scar around it? Do they have a hernia? All of these things go into consideration um, in, in choosing a technique. Here's the, on the left how we do the diastasis plication. Um, and, um, and then this, this is how we do a full abdominoplasty with an umbilical float on the right. So here are some pre and post-operative results. These are my patients. This is a patient who wasn't overweight, but she just, she looked like she was pregnant because she had such a substantial um, diastasis and all the working on the world wasn't helping it. So she was pretty thrilled, um, you know, with the repair. Now let's talk about mommy makeovers. What's a mommy makeover? <laughs> um, you know, as you can see, this is what's happened when you've had a bunch of children and things just start to go. So um, it usually actually refers to any kind of combined procedures. Um, it's not specific, sometimes it's facial and body procedures combined, but it's really nice to be able to just 
um, rejuvenate everything at the same time, although there's a limit to how much we can get done at once. Um, this is a before and after of a patient of mine who had a breast augmentation and a tummy tuck. She wasn't heavy, but as you can see, she has that classic uh, C-section shelf um, and she had a pretty substantial diastasis. And so, um, you know, I was able to really give her back a lot of, a lot of contour. Um, she was otherwise in great shape and she was pretty happy with the results as you could see. Um, so just some quick stuff on the arms and legs. Um, a brachioplasty is considered an arm lift. It depends, the, the incision and the scar really depends on how much uh, extra tissue the patient has. If the extra skin is pretty substantial, then you end up having to do a full brachioplasty, which is a long scar going down the arm. If there's less tissue and it's more fatty, we can always try liposuction, especially with something like body tie, which is radio frequency. Um, and if it's mild skin, then sometimes we can just do a, a short scar brachioplasty and hide it in the underarm. These are usually done under general anesthesia, unless it's just liposuction or short, short scar brachioplasty. If it's a full brachioplasty, then they do have drains in and ACE wraps or compression sleeves. Here's an example of a before and after. This was a full brachioplasty. The thighs are kind of similar. Again, it depends on how much laxity the patient has in the area. Um, this is a crescent uh, thigh plasty, which leaves you with kind of scars in the groin area. But if there's a lot of laxity, then that incision does extend down the thigh. Here's a medial thigh plasty. This patient actually had an incision that extended down the thigh, but again, it's hidden in the inner thigh, so you don't really see it. And then um, the last procedure I'm going to talk about is something that I didn't train about uh, when I was a resident, um, but I became pretty proficient at as an attending doing, especially as a female plastic surgeon. Um, labioplasty basically addresses the labia minora or the inner lips. And these days with everybody wearing, you know, leggings all the time and going to soul cycle and, you know, getting Brazilian bikini waxes and People have so much more access to what's out there in terms of you know, comparing themselves to other people. They can see what's on the internet. Um, and so I think all of those things make it so that um, patients become very aware of what is too much tissue or what makes them look different. I think patients come in just complaining of extra tissue. They come in complaining of asymmetry, which is pretty common, some of it pretty substantial, hyperpigmentation of the labial edges. And those are things that we can completely deal with with this procedure. There are two real techniques. One is an edge, um, which is on the right, which is an edge excision. The other one's a wedge excision on the left. Um, people, some, not, some plastic surgeons are married to one or the other. I'll do whichever one uh, really addresses what the patient's concerns are. I think for most patients, the edge trim works really well. It can be done under local anesthesia. I usually recommend some sedation just to make the patient more comfortable. These are absorbable sutures. You know, these areas are designed to heal really quickly. Um, they're used to, you know, they're basically used to trauma with childbirth and sex. And so the, uh, this mucosa heals very, very quickly in the patients, but the patients can't wear tampons or have sex for, for six weeks. And I also tell them no real working out for six weeks, unless at about two weeks, they can start things like Pilates. So this is a before and after typical patient comes in complaining on the left of too much tissue. This is what they look like on the right. Um, a few words on scar management. Silicone works best. Um, there are creams, there are strips. Patients ask me, you know, what do you like? I tell them uh, my two favorite brands for the strips are, silag are Silagen and for the cream is Biocornium because it has SPF in it. Um, I really tell them use whatever it is that you're going to be most compliant with because what works is whatever you're going to use. Whatever you're going to use. Um, laser resurfacing is another option if the scars are really prominent or if they have a tendency towards keloids, I'll do a Kenalog injection or a 5-FU injection. Um, and the other thing that's really important is sun protection, especially in the first six months to a year. But the reality in plastic surgery is it's always a trade-off between contour and scarring. And the goal at the end of the day is to make you feel good about the way you look. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk tonight. I found that very interesting and I definitely learned a lot about the different procedures that you do. Um, there are a few questions in the Q&A box. So the first one is, is there an age when you recommend starting interventions? Depends what kind of interventions, I guess. You know, I see there are certain things I, I see teenagers for like rhinoplasty and breast reduction and sometimes labiaplasty. Um, you know, I think for things like uh, skin rejuvenation, uh, I would say as early as your 20s. 
in terms of you can get gentle skin peels. I think Botox is a great preventative intervention. And it's much easier to kind of prevent motion um, beforehand than it is to kind of address the wrinkles once they start to form. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, if you are in a weight loss program, should you be at goal weight before undertaking any procedures? So in general, yes, if you're planning to lose a lot of weight, I think, you know, for people who are at that five to 10 pounds, it's not a big deal, but um, you really want your body mass index to be below 30, ideally to undergo some kind of a plastic surgery procedure. I actually won't really operate on anyone with a BMI over 32. So if you come in and the BMI is over 32, I really say, let's try to you know, get your weight under control first. And for weight loss patients, bariatric surgery patients who come in for post-bariatric surgery contouring, um, it's actually really important that their weight is stable for 12 to 18 months before we do anything. Okay. And one last question. Um, I know you touched on this at the beginning of your talk. I'm always interested in why people choose the specialties that they chose. And you mentioned why you chose plastic surgery, but why specifically cosmetic plastic surgery? So I don't exclusively do um, cosmetic plastic surgery. I also mm -hmm. do reconstructive. Obviously there was a lot to cover in this talk and I, I, I had to limit it or we would have been here for, for uh, two hours at least. Um, but I, there is a, I find a particularly artistic component to cosmetic plastic surgery um, that has always appealed to me. Um, I think even for the reconstructive stuff that I do, I always like to bring an aesthetic eye to it. I think that, you know, especially for patients undergoing mastectomies and reconstruction, I think, you know, I always like to say to them that my goal is not just to give you back some kind of a breast mount to put in a bra, but to actually make you feel great about the way you look naked again. So I think that, you know, for me, um, uh, I've always, uh, you know, I used to love to draw when I was a kid. I used to like to say that I wanted to be a, a fashion designer and then a surgeon like my dad. So I, I think for me, it, the two really came together um, in doing a lot of aesthetic plastic surgery. And I think that for me, there's also a lot of fulfillment um, in doing something that, you know, for the most part makes people feel great about themselves and makes them happy every day. I think, you know, we're all wired differently. And I have tremendous respect for my colleagues who, take care of really sick people and, you know, like the oncologists who, who deal with life and death situations. You know, for me, I, I guess I just like something that's a little lighter. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for your talk tonight, Dr. Peminger. Um, I found that very interesting and insightful. And thank you to everyone else for joining us tonight and have a good night. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. You too.